as, as uh, John mentioned, my, I'm an unapologetic believer in science. And it's, I'm going to be presenting homeopath from a scientific point of view. Um, and I, I, when I've said this before, people say, well, science doesn't know everything. Well, science knows it doesn't know everything. That's why science doesn't stop. So, just because we don't know everything don't, doesn't mean we can fill the gaps in with uh, any story we like. So we're going to talk about homeopathy. And not homeopaths, I'm disappointed. Oh. Okay, the, um, we'll, we'll go back to the notion of disease. Could you, defi could you define it for us? Homeopathy? Yes. It, uh, it, the def definition will, it's, it is a, it, it'll come in the, first I'm going to talk about disease, the theories of disease, how we get better. And then we'll look at the treatments of the century. We'll get to homeopathy, I'll explain in more detail than uh, you, you ever want. Well, the, the, you know, back in the day, diseases befell us. They, 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 no rhyme or reason, someday we'd be ill, someday we'd be sick, sometimes we wake up with headaches, whatever. No one could figure out why. Um, it's, it's not even, we're not even certain whether people understand the notion, understood the notion of disease, seeing as, you know, your, if you imagine your daily life, it would be, you know, you would probably have parasites, you would probably have worms, you would probably have a whole bunch of injuries just from your daily living. And it's hard to define that what we take for granted now as being in good health. But the Greeks were the first ones to come up with the idea that, yes, there is such a thing as disease, it's not, uh, it's not desirable, and it's due to an imbalance of four humors. Now these four humors were yellow bile, blood, phlegm, and black bile. These humors, these liquids, were in your body, and they, when you were healthy, they were in perfect balance. And when you were ill, one of these, are, they were out of balance. And, uh, we, we also use this for other things. I, I know when you notice the, when we describe personality, we'll say someone has a sanguine personality, they're bubbly and extrovert, or phlegmatic personality. And black bile is, for, the Greek black bile is melancholic, so we get melancholy from black bile, so we still have that, that idea that uh, remains from the Greeks. Now, the obvious thing, if you had an excess or an imbalance of this, was to basically remove it and try and get it back in, uh, try and get get it back in, in balance. So here's, here's a picture of uh, someone bleeding someone. Bloodletting was a very very common a common uh, treatment, but anything basically that could, you could expel something. So. You could induce sweating, you could give diuretic to induce urination, um, purgatives, you can induce diarrhea, <laughs> you can induce sweating, anything. Anything that got something out of your system. Now, bloodletting was a very, uh, a very common one, and I think it was uh, George Washington. He, asked, he developed a throat infection. He asked to be bled, and over the course of 10 hours, they bled him with three, three and a half liters of blood. Now, you only have about five. And uh, he, he died in 1799 that night, so, which is hardly surprising. But he did have a throat infection. Um, you know, we look at this and we think, well, that's primitive, right? We, just, we, we, don't, we don't do this anymore. But you, you, still, you can still buy these cupping, you can still buy those. Um, they're little glass cups that put them on your back. You, you pump the air out and they form these little welts to extract the toxins out of you. And, and I'm sure you've seen the diets, you know, the cleansing diets, get rid of your toxins, the enemas. Uh, I, we had one last year in uh, Open Circle advocating, you know, get rid of these toxins that are, that are still in your body um, through enemas. There is no scientific rationale behind any of these, uh, any, any of these uh, treatments. Now, this lasted for centuries. You know, no one had any idea. And uh, until 
the next theory of the disease was, was a miasm, or the miasmatic theory. Now, they, they thought that diseases were called by, caused by breathing in bad air. And they associated bad air with um, decaying substances, poor sanitation. So now you've got this link between, between disease, poor sanitation. But they hadn't quite connected any germ, this predated germ theory. Um, and they believed that you couldn't catch something by touching someone else, but you could get it by breathing the same air as someone else. And uh, here is a, a depiction of the, the, the miasm uh, going across the battlefield. Um, and uh, this was, this, this helped until the mid, mid 19th century. And uh, germ theory came along and no one believed in the miasm theory anymore except for homeopaths. <coughs> Now you can have the homeopathic miasms, and we'll go, I'll, I'll, I'll go into detail about why. But I just wanted to point out that homeopathy still clings to the idea, a pre-germ theory of disease. Now we, we germ theory is basically, basically the standard scientific explanation of why we are ill, for, for contagious diseases at least. And we can see germs, we are aware that uh, they can be transmitted, we know a lot about them, we know about antibiotics, antivirals, and this is, this is so accepted that it's, it's in, now it's in the realm of common sense. You know, if you were going for, uh, for surgery, and the surgeon said, oh, actually I don't believe in the germ theory, I won't bother washing my hands before all you up, you think, no, I, I yes. <laughs> So it's pretty much, uh, and then we have non-communicable diseases, which are chronic long-term conditions, and they're the leading cause of death in, uh, in the U.S. Hereditary lifestyle trauma are, are unknown. And, and we have to admit, there are some diseases that we do not know what causes them. Autism is a good example, despite the many theories. And the way we treat disease, communicable disease, we have vaccines for prevention, we have antibiotics for cure, we have antivirals, and we also have time. Time is, take two aspirin and call me in the morning. Right? It, it's like, if you wait long enough, it's likely to go away. Have we all had the flu this year? You know, it went away. So time is a, time is a great healer. And chronic diseases, we either use medicines or surgery, to either cure or, or manage the disease and rest. You know, especially uh, if you have a lifestyle, if there's a problem with your lifestyle, just give it up for a while. Now, how do we get better? Now, the, um, your, your body has mechanisms to, um, to return you to health. You have your skin, you have you have lots of protective barriers to try and stop things entering your body. And when they enter your body, there are various mechanisms, the, the immune system, to try and take care of the disease and return you to normal. Now, normally you, you your body, and this, this, this system is working all the time, you know, and it's, I'm sure we've all heard of immune boosting things. <clears throat> No one's really measured how to, uh, no one's really figured out how to measure um, the potency of the immune system so that you can measure whether you actually can boost it. These systems are working all the time, they're working right now. And um, the, um, and we have this regression to the mean. That means that if you get up in the morning or your, your back aches, there is this system where you just, you go back to being feeling well again. You have a headache, you wake up with a stiff neck, and slowly you get back to normal. It's all regression to the mean. And it recognizes that many diseases are cyclical in nature, and they'll come and they'll go, and they'll come and they'll go. And, you know, but what takes the credit for getting better? 
So if uh, John here and Rick, they both wake up, or they both at night time, they have a terrible headache. And I say, ah, I've got a terrible headache. And I say to Rick, don't worry, probably in the morning, everything will be fine. But I say to John, oh, here's a couple of pills. You know, take these, you'll be fine. And it could be anything. It could just be, you know, take this, take this sugar cube. Books wonders for headaches. Now in the morning when the headaches are gone, what is Rick going to think? Oh, well, my headache just went away. What's John going to think? He's going to think, wow, that should be cute. I really did the trick, you know. I really, uh, I'm, I'm going to try that the next time. So you've got to be careful when you take credit, you know, what you credit for making yourself better. Time is usually the, uh, the big one. Now we get on to homeopathy. Okay, so this is Samuel Hahnemann, who was a German physician, did his medical degree in 1779, and for 10 years he struggled mightily as a physician. Um, he ended up dying a millionaire in Paris because he, what am I going to say, discovered, he invented homeopathy. Uh, he, was, um, <coughs> he was working with uh, the bar. That this Shona tree contains quinine, or quinine, and uh, that is useful in malaria, right? That was the treatment of choice for malaria, quinine. He took a little too much, and he, he, had a little, he, he overdosed a little bit on quinine. But he noticed that he, he had a fever and he got the chills. And he says, oh, isn't that a coincidence that the stuff we use to cure malaria gives me the same symptoms as the disease. Therefore, and it was this one observation, therefore, he came up with a law that said, like cures like. If you can give something to a healthy person that creates the same symptoms as the disease, then you can cure the disease. Did, did everyone follow that? So, he came up with a like cures like, or the law of similars. So if you, um, if, if you were feeling nauseous, and you wanted a homeopath homeopathic cure, you would give someone a dilute version of something that produces nausea, and that will, like cures like, you will know, cure it. Now, homeopathy was, uh, was rather successful at the time. Because its alternative was draining three and a half liters of blood out of someone's arm for a sore throat. So you can imagine what, basically whatever he did was going to be better than that. But uh, he, what he used in his substances to try and cure people were the medicines of the day. And these weren't very uh, friendly chemicals. Mercury, sulfur, a lot of the belladonna, a lot of, you know, a lot of arsenic was used. Um, so basically, most of the medicines of the day were poisons. Mm -hmm. And so he developed this law of infinitesimals, which said, what I'll do is I'll dilute it. Now, another observation he made was when he diluted it, it seemed to be even stronger. And that's because he was basically diluting a poison. So people, instead of getting even sicker with the poison, Every time he diluted it, you know, it seemed to work better. So this, had, so homeopaths had this, had this curious idea that the more diluted substances, the more powerful it is. So this is the second law of homeopathy. Um, the third law is the principle of succussion. Now he believed that it wasn't the substance itself that cured you. It was a property of the substance which was. In, when it was diluted, when it was dissolved into water, it was somehow transferred to the water. And he used succussion, which was banging the, uh, the tube of water with the stuff against a, a leather box, and that would transfer the miracle properties of the substance to the, uh, to the water. And the last one was the law of individualization. And the law of individual individualization says that you don't, you cannot be diagnosed with anything that anyone else can be diagnosed with. Right? You are unique. And therefore, your complaints are unique. So there is no diagnosis of 
appendicitis. Now, the diagnosis of appendicitis is just a word that's used for convenience to describe a set of symptoms. You've got pain here, you've got fever, constipated, you've got elevated white cell count. We put those all together and we call, rather than repeat the symptoms all the time, we just say appendicitis. In Hanneman's case, he said, no, 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 they, this is, they, these are just individual, uh, these are individual some symptoms that no two people have in common. Um, so, what about these substances that, uh, what about the theory of action? Well, I was explaining that if, if you have a substance that mimics the problem, then a dilute version of that substance will cure the problem. So if coffee keeps you awake, <coughs> dilute coffee will put you to sleep. Right? The more dilute, the stronger the effect. In fact, if you dilute all the coffee molecules out of it, the water will remember the property of the, the coffee that kept you awake, and the effect will be even stronger. And that, that property of the water then can be transferred by dropping it on a sugar pill. And I don't know whether you've seen the little homeopathic pills, they're usually round spheres of lactose. Mm -hmm. And then by taking that, then your body can use that energy to, to, to heal itself, in this case, to, to, uh, as, a, as a sleeping, sleeping agent. Now they, they rely on this thing called water memory. So they have a substance, <coughs> they dilute it, and they claim that the water remembers the healing power of their homeopathic substance. But this, this has never been demonstrated. Um, and if it were to exist, we would have to rewrite most of physics and chemistry. And you've got to acknowledge that the water that we drink today has been around for billions of years. It's the same water. You know, it's not made by Perrier or Bonafonte or whatever. <laughs> it's the same stuff. It just goes in cycles through rain and sea and rivers, etc. So, you can imagine in a billion years, it's come into contact with lots of substances. And it's been succussed either through rain, waves, waterfalls. So, one, one criticism leveled against homeopathy is that if it, uh, if water has memory, <laughs> then homeopathy is. Yeah. So how do you how do you make a homeopathic remedy? Okay, first is a consult. Now the consult is very important. The consult is very detailed. It lasts at least an hour. Anyone who's been to a doctor in the US, you know, he's looking at you, his watch the moment you come through the door. You, you come in, you say, oh, doctor, I've got a, a pain in my back. It's, it's probably two in the afternoon. It's probably seen six people with the same complaint. It's the most popular complaint in a doctor's office. And he says, oh, it'll <coughs> go away in time. Oh, look, here's some pain pills. And you think, you know, did he really care? It just... You know, it probably didn't even look up. Here's, 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 your, here's your script. The homeopath, by, by contrast, will, will go into great detail. Great detail, not only about your health, but it'll, it, it's holistic. It'll look at your environment. It'll look at your relationship with, uh, with family members. But they'll also ask about... Uh, your dreams. I'll also ask about what happened when you were when you were a child. What sort of uh, relationship did you have with your older sister? What they believe is that your body has a wisdom, and that wisdom will allow it to cure itself. And all you need to do is to tap into that wisdom through intuition. And there's various ways that a homeopath can do this. The question. But you're getting an intuitive feel of the person that they are. You, you want to find this individualized, uh, their, their individualized spirit. And there are things they do like they, they will 
they'll, they'll put the fingers together like this, they'll ask you a question, and they'll try and pull your fingers apart. Or they'll do it themselves with their own fingers. They can even do it over the telephone, they can ask you a question, and try and pull their own fingers apart to see whether what you're saying has any significance or not. So this is... Um, so here's a, here's a typical history of a woman with uterine fibroids. So this woman has, has fibroid masses in her uterus. This is, the, this is a typical history for a patient with uterine fibroids. She's lo loquacious and loud. She's anxious. She doesn't want to live. She's desperate. Feels humiliated, ashamed, rejected, angry, offended, lonely. She has religious affections, relationship problems, workaholic, absence of nurturing in childhood, parents fighting, and at last, uterine fibroids, and she's constipated and retains fluid. So that is now, after this, after this consult, this is what you end up with. Now, the next thing you have to do is you have to choose the substance, right? The aim is to mimic the symptoms of disease. There are two... There are two references. There's a repertory and there's a materia medica. There are repertory sort of cross-references the all these symptoms you have with substances, and then you go to materia medica, and uh, you can choose the substance. These substances there are. It, it can be water that's been exposed to moonlight. It can be dogs' earwax, tears from a weeping young girl, a fossilized dinosaur or bone, arsenic, poison ivy. In fact, there is a there is a homeopathic substance called uh, Berlinis muresis. Now, Berlinis muresis. All, all homeopathic substances have Latin sounding names. So, Berlinis muresis. It is some of the concrete from the Berlin Wall. <laughs> <laughs> they said that the homeopaths believed that the Berlin Wall absorbed the depression and the sadness from the East Germans. And that by taking a small substance, you can induce the same depression, and it's used as as an antidepressant. And I checked online, and you can buy it. You know, Homeo being a homeopath is not a protected, not like being a doctor, a nurse, or a dietitian. It's not a protected uh, title. So you can, you, we're all homeopaths, right? You can go and buy some Berlin Wall to dilute. Um, and then you go to Materia Medica, and you look at. Uh, you know, what substances you should use. Now, there is a... There is the... The... They even had a, a remedy for Ebola. And they said it was the rattlesnake venom, yellow viper, bushmaster snake, phosphorus, mercury. And they said, you know, we've got a feeling this is going to work. Because the Ebola virus under a microscope looked like a snake, so I was I, I was willing to provide them with as much of that substance as possible and send them over to Africa, and uh, I was only banking on needing to spend the one-way ticket, the money on the one-way ticket. But um, they have, and I didn't, I didn't have. Uh, this next one, I had a list. For natrium muriaticum, and this is useful in. And I, I, I'm sorry, I don't have my list here. And what it was? Uh, oh wait, yeah, it is. And it's the the. Uh, it affects the mind, head, eyes, ears, nose, face, stomach, abdomen, rectum, urine, respiratory, sleep, skin, etc. And then you go to the Materia Medica, and you find out it's very useful in heavy eyelids in anemic headache of schoolgirls, in constipation, diarrhea, sensation of coldness of heart, palms hot and perspiring, hangnails, dreams of robbers, oily skin, warts on palm and hands, and chills between 9am and 11am. And that is actually in the book. That's, that's what they try to find out. Now, natrium muriaticum, can anyone guess what that is? Muriaticum. Common table <laughs> So, so the next thing is, you know, choosing the substance. The, the way they get these substances is that they, they, someone comes up with an idea, 
and they say, oh, well, let's try, let's try this snippet of curtain here, let's try this scraping. Mm -hmm. So what they do is they give it to healthy people, and they say, I'm going to give you this, this dilute sample of this paste here. I think it's got, pro I think it's got it, properties of intelligence because of you know, all the people that come here. <laughs> <laughs> and they say, uh, and, and they say, well, keep a diary. Keep a diary for about six months. Anything that happens to you in six months, write it down. Got an itch on the back of your leg, 11 a.m., write it down. You got anything? And then that's how they compile this, this materia medica. Now, dilution is a big thing. Dilution is a big thing. And what they do is they dilute it one part in 100. Then take one part of that and put it on. So it's a bit like... Uh, so, and the homeopath freely admits that there isn't a single molecule of the substance left in the solution. They freely admit that it's water, just water. But they believe that the water has absorbed the healing properties of the substance. And uh, if you, you, you will see on homeopathic medicines numbers like 30C or 200C. And that means in 30C it's been serially diluted uh, 30 times. Now, serial dilution of 30 times, that would be the equivalent of having, if you can imagine a globe the size of the. With, with a circumference of the Earth, right? So it's a big globe, <coughs> circumference of the Earth, there'd be one molecule of substance if that entire globe was full of water. The chance of you getting any active substance is zero. But they, they, they go through this dilution, and between every dilution, they have to go, I, that's when they go this magic succussion. And they hit it 10 or 20 times, and uh, this transfers the healing energy from the substance to the water. And you'll see here, here's a typical uh, homeopathic pharmacy. And Hanuman used a leather book to do the, he banged it against the leather book. So we have this modern pharmacy, and they have an old leather book to bang it against. A lot of the pharmacists now, they do actually have little, little conical machines that vibrate the, uh, the, uh, the solution. And they have this machine uh, that will do serial dilution, dil dilution very rapidly. And to get to a 200C dilution, which there aren't enough molecules in three universes, if they were all water, to contain the one molecule of substance, that's how diluted it is. But it, it can do that in two weeks. It would take a person six months to do that level of dilution. So then they prepare the pills. And here's the, uh, here's the typical homeopathic remedy. They're spheres of lactose, and they drop the, the magic water onto the sphere. And somehow, because, because the water evaporates, the healing property of the water then goes into the sphere, and you take them, and somehow the healing property then knows what to do with your, your body wisdom. And then you track progress. And the things that the homeopath is looking for is aggravations. And aggravations is a very, which is a very convenient thing. Aggravations are either an exacerbation of the problem, which you'd expect because you're giving something that promotes the same symptoms you have, even though it doesn't exist, or it means that your, your condition is getting worse. Either way, that proves that something is happening. So what, what they do then is then they, there's constant re-evaluation, re you get new remedies, you go through the same process. And uh, if it isn't working, perhaps you've used an antidote. You maybe you ate spicy foods, drank coffee, used a cell phone, didn't get enough sleep, maybe it's your fault. <laughs> but the question is, you know, regardless of, of what's been said, does it work? Does it work? Well, the homeopaths obviously say yes. And I'll tell you now, the homeopaths believe that it works. They're not out to, they're not out to cheat you. They believe it works. Uh, homeopathy works any better than placebo. And we'll go into placebo effects in a moment. Now here's the, uh, 
is a mechanism of uh, homeopathy with your spirit in the middle and your aura and it's acting on the action forces, the you know, vital force of deteriorating material energies of the mind. Um, you take that as you find it and of course here, if, if we had only part of surgery, <laughs> and in actual fact, in Arizona, home, homeopaths, can you read it in the back? It says, homeopathic surgery, quick nurse, hand me the nothing, as there is nothing in a homeopathic uh, remedy. But in, in Arizona, homeopaths are licensed to perform minor surgery, and there is a there is a case ongoing where a, where a homeopathic practitioner decided that um, liposuction qualified as minor surgery and he performed liposu oops, liposuction on a woman. I won't ask what he gave her for, as an anesthetic, but she died later that night. And uh, so he's in extremely hot magical water. <laughs> And the question is, you know, okay, you know, no one's proved it to work. But people say, well, I've taken homeopathic stuff, it works. I don't care what your science says. I don't care. I've taken it, it works. Well, there's two ways of getting better. One is feeling better, the other one's getting better. Now, here, this is the only chart, and I know you can't see it at the back, but let me explain what this is. This is the, on this side here, is a subjective improvement, how well you're feeling. This is for people with asthma. This is albuterol, you ever seen the albuterol inhaler? <sighs> you know, if you have an asthma attack. This is a placebo. It's the same inhaler, but it doesn't have any active ingredient. Here is the homeopathic preparation, and there's no intervention control, which basically says nothing. You know, you don't do anything. And if you notice, the look, the placebo and the homeopathic preparation, when you ask people how they feel after they've taken it, it's about the same. And so you say, well, look, look, albuterol's no good. You know, you can give someone a placebo and they'll feel just as well. And you can give someone a homeopathic preparation, they'll feel just as well. You know, that disproves your science, you know, as being a, you know, being something uh, that actually works. The problem here is this is a subjective feeling. On this next slide, this is the actual, this is called the FEV, and it's the forced expiratory volume. I don't know whether you've seen one of these. I have asked myself, I have one of these. What you do is you take a deep breath, and you, ex you exhale as much as you can. At my age, I should be able to get to 560, I got to 540. Um, not too bad. I, I've had it down where I've been in the 200s. It's, it's, uh, so so this, is, this is a measure of how well your asthma is being treated. Right? Now what happens with the albuterol, yes, you can breathe again. You are, you are actually better. With the placebo and the homeopathic no intervention, you are just in the same crisis you were before you took it. There is no... So you actually walk around saying, oh, I've got my, uh, my homeopathic inhaler. I feel better. You're actually on the verge of some asthmatic crisis. So just because you feel better <coughs> is, is not always uh, a good thing. If you went to the doctor and said, doctor, I've got a pain here. And he says, that's okay. I've got, I've got analgesics. You come back and say, it's still here, it's getting stronger. I'll give you more analgesics. Come back, it's still getting stronger. Give you even, even stronger ones. You wouldn't think much of that doctor. But you just don't, you don't treat things just by what makes you feel better. So this is, a, this is a prime example of the danger of homeopathy. And here is the oral asthma spray. Now you notice they don't have an inhaler. It's a spray. You just put it on your tongue. It's only water, magic water, but and uh, here it is. You can buy it on the pharmacy shelves. Surely it must be it must be valid, right? I mean, they can't say. Oops, sorry, 
They can't say, you know, homeopathic oral spray, not a rescue inhaler, well that's a relief. Um, for temporary relief of minor asthma symptoms including shortness of breath, wheezing and tightness in chest. Taste free. Well, you know, it may relieve you of, of those symptoms, but you will not be any better. In fact, you will be in a worse situation. Right, 16 bucks for a, a little bottle of water. And here you have the unit price, which you find <laughs> on the shelves. <laughs> so here's a pint. This is what it would be per pint. So you're paying $128 per pint of water to spray in your mouth, which doesn't taste. So, but the thing is, then how can they claim it works? Because I, I saw in there that it said for the relief of it. said it works. Well, homeopathic substances are classified as drugs under the law. But, and, and this happened, homeopathy at the turn of the century was disappearing. Um, with, with germs, with vaccinations, inoculations, antibiotics, homeopathy wasn't, you know, was on the decline. There was a, a, a senator called Ryland. Copeland, who, he was a homeopath, he still believed in homeopathy, and he sneaked this into the Food, Drugs and Cosmetics Acts of 1938, <coughs> and he said, this is because of people's choice, we shouldn't force them to have, you know, whatever medicine we, we dole out, people should have a choice, so he managed to get it into the Food, Drugs and Cosmetics Acts, now the the FDA really didn't know what to do with these homeopathic medicines. They said, don't worry, you know, they're, they're harmless. You know, and it's... So the FDA said, okay, there is this thing called the Homeopathic Pharmacopeia of the United States, HPUS. I don't know whether you've ever seen on your, your medications, it says UPS, United States Pharmacopeia. In the UK, the British Pharmacopeia, BP. And that is, that is just a reference book of all the drugs and their level of purity and their strength, etc. And that is the reference manual. And they have a convention, the homeopaths, where they, where they uh, add to this thing. So let's take homeopaths and drug companies. Now we all hate drug companies, right? Right, they are evil, aren't they? Yeah. I, I have no apologies for the drug companies. I just want to say this, that drug companies may be evil, they may be suppressing cures in, in favor of uh, managing a, an illness to make more money, does not say anything about the science of uh, modern day pharmacists, modern, modern day pharmaceuticals, all right? Whatever you think of the drug companies, it, it's still science based. So the... Um, both of their, both, all the homeo homeopathic treatments are in this pharmacopoeia, all the drug companies appear, all the drugs appear in there. Now to get there, sorry, to get there, all you need to do is to present it at the, this convention. You present it at the convention, there's a panel of homeopaths that say, yeah, sounds, sounds good. We'll add it to the uh, pharmacopoeia. You've done some studies on this, yeah. I, uh, you know, I had a lady who, you know, suffered from a sprayed ankle, and I gave her some of this, and, you know, within six months she was walking fine. <laughs> so they say, okay, well, let's, uh... And the drug companies, they, they, they're required to, to have a little more independence in their studies. They publish their own studies, of course, but the FDA requires that they are independently backed up. Now, both these go to the FDA for approval. The FDA says, ah, it's in the HPUS, Homeopaths, you know what you're doing, we don't. It's automatically approved. And the, the, but the FDA, they say, oh, no, no, no. We, we, we need an independent review before we'll add this out. There may be years, years of review. And then they're released to the public. And so you can see that the FDA automatically accepts anything that's in the HPUS. And with the drug companies, it's not a little playing field, no matter what you think of the drug companies. So this is how they get away with it. 
Now, is homeopathy dangerous? Well, is it actively dangerous? In other words, can giving someone a homeopathic remedy makes someone sick? And the answer is definitively no. Unless you're allergic to water, no. Um, I don't know whether you know James Randi, the famous skeptic. He talks about homeopathy. The first thing he does before his uh, show, he gets a, a box of uh, homeopathic sleeping pills, a hundred of them, and he just swallows them all. Right? And uh, he, he has never fallen asleep during the presentation. Now here is, uh, this is in Britain. Here is a group of people doing exactly the same thing. Um, a group of, of skeptics will uh, either go to homeopathic conventions or quite often they'll, they'll stage this outside of emergency rooms, outside of A&E, and they all overdose on several, several boxes of homeopathic medicine. And uh, the press is there usually to cover it. And they're just making a point that there's, there's, there really is nothing in it. But you've also got to ask the question, is it dangerous because it seeks to replace real medicine? And that, as you saw with the, with the inhaler, the answer, is, the answer is yes. Now, I'm not sure what Steve Jobs, I don't know whether you recognize Steve Jobs here. Steve Jobs was, was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And pancreatic cancer is usually fatal, no matter what you do. Pancreatic cancer is one of the worst. However, he had a very rare form of pancreatic cancer, and it was curable. In fact, after nine, after the survival rate after five years is 99 to, is about 95 to 99 percent survival rate. After five years, people have had treatment; they're still alive after five years. Regular cancer, people are not so lucky. Regular pancreatic cancer, are not so lucky. So he was, he went for an MRI of his uh, his colon. And someone noticed that he had a little spot on his pancreas. And they said, oh, you know, we'll, we'll do some tests and they ran some more tests and they said, oh, you've got this, this pancreatic, that's the bad news, you've got pancreatic cancer. Good news, it's the type of cancer that we can cure. No problem. And so the way to do, cut it out, you'll be fine. He says, no, I'm going to go the natural way. So he went to Dean, Or uh, Dean Ornish, you know Dean Ornish? He's a... Yeah. He's a uh, nutritionist, another non-protected uh, title. The protected title is dietitian. Anybody can call themselves a nutritionist. Anyway, he tried, the, he tried various alternative therapies. I am not sure if homeopathy was one of them. But um, he, he, he went back for a test and they found that the cancer had spread outside of his pancreas and was now involved in his liver. And after that, he said he threw all his money at conventional medicine but it was too late. He had a liver transplant, he had a Whipple's bypass, he had various surgeries. It was too late. Even with all his money, he couldn't undo the harm of waiting. So, is it dangerous? Is a homeopathy for accidents and emergencies. There's 18 vials of water there. <laughs> it's funny, but it's tragic. You know, I mean, it is, it is just... For accidents and emergencies, it is just, it's tragic that you would rely on anything like this, this magical thing, to cure something. Now, I think I've got time. There is a video, and if I can hopefully work this thing. There's a video of what a homeopathic accident and emergency, or emergency room, would look like. So this is homeopathic accident and emergency. Involved in a road traffic accident. Yeah, running home, expecting internal injuries to get contusions to the head. Okay, it's Blue Park. It's probably a solution of Arlington, Montana. Stack. Right. One part in a million. I'm sure, it looks serious. You're right. We need to stick with those. One part in ten million. Oh, they've got that. Oh, they've got a chicken That'll be Well, give me some wolf's bait, also known as monster in here. And a whole tray of flower remedies. Oh, the chakras are fading. We need some crystals. That's pushing some purples into quartz. <laughs> Right. Make that actual marine course. Oh, cool. 
Okay, he's stabilizing. Now, does anybody know what sort of car he's in? Blue for one day, apparently. Right, get me a bit of blue for one day. Put it in water, shake it, dilute it, shake it again, dilute it again. Do some more shaking, dilute it some more, and then put three drops on his tongue. If that doesn't cure him, I don't know what will. Look at this, Simon. What is it? Tell you, this poor chap's got long to live. What else? It's lifeline. Very short. As far as he gets, not too clever either. Sagittarius. Brace yourself for a surprise. Things are about to change for you. So we are in this. Wait. What? We can try drawing a bit more lifeline on with Byron. Fuck. <laughs> you know a better idea? Let's see what happens. Time of death. 334. Tough day. I just lost some losing them. It happens. I don't know. Sometimes I think a trace solution of deadly nightshade or a statistically negligible quantity of arsenic just isn't enough. That's crazy talk, Simon. Okay, so you kill the old patient with cancer or heart disease, or bronchitis, flu, chicken pox, or measles, but. When someone comes in with a vague sense of unease, or a touch of the nerves, or even just more money than sense, you'll be left a bottle of basically just water in one hand, a huge invoice in the other. I suppose you're right. I am. Now I'm drinking. I need one. Excuse me. Two more homeopathic lockers, please. <laughs> <laughs> Strong stuff. <laughs> yeah. So this is probably one of the most unconscionably immoral things I can imagine to manufacture. Someone is in dire need of, accident, of, of treatment for an, after an accident emergency. To, to give them water and to hope for the best is just. Now, is it home homeopathy profitable? Well. I mean, it declined, it declined in the 50s, but it, it resurged in the 70s. Someone said this was with the New Age movement and spiritualism. It's now a $4 billion a year industry. Peanuts compared to the evil drug companies, right? But, but still, it's, uh, it's not pocket change. There's a low barrier to entry. Okay, homeopathy in many countries is not a protected title, anybody can call themselves a homeopath, you can go to school and you can get uh, degrees in homeopathy following a couple of weekend courses. They have lobbying support, they have a big lobbying group. The biggest one is the Integrative Health Pe Healthcare Polic Policy Consortium. And the Complementary and Alternative Medicine also has there's another group. And they have um, Senator Orrin Hatch, I don't know where he's from. Utah. Utah. He is their champion. He manages to get all the homeopathy. He'll block any, any anti-homeopathic uh, legislation. And remember, it's not regulated. The FDA gives the regulation to the homeopaths. Now, when you buy a dietary supplement, when it actually has something in it, you'll notice you'll, they're all labeled. And they'll say this statement has not been evaluated. This statement? Now, this statement has been. This is, they can't say treats anymore, right? On, on supplements. So, so, this statement has not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Because it's got something in it. Homeopathy, not so much. Now, I don't know about financials, but this is Guaron. This is one of the most successful homeopathic. Uh, companies in the world. If you notice their, their R&D costs, basically it's four dollars, their marketing costs are a hundred and fourteen dollars. So basically for every hundred dollars they spend on marketing, they spend three on research and development. Now drug companies are about fifty percent. They spend, for every hundred dollars they spend on marketing, they spend fifty on research, which is still a paltry figure. Samsung, I believe, it's, uh, they, they, it's almost even. So, now, is homeopathy, is homeopathy safe for the homeopath? Well, it used to be because you're dispensing water. 
He walked, walked home in that bill. Well, I don't know whether you've seen this. You can buy this at Walmart. Zyka. And it guarantees to shorten the duration of your call. And it's listed as a homeopathic medicine. Now, Zycan, if you notice a 1C dilution, that means it has, the, the, the ingredient hasn't been diluted enough. There's still some active stuff in there. And what it is, is a mixture of zinc, gluconate, it's a mixture of zinc salts. And uh, you spray it up your nose, it's listed as homeopathic, the FDA considers it a homeopathic substance, until people started to say, well, after I've taken this, I, I've lost my sense of smell. I got smelling one. And they found out that this was frying their, their smell receptors in their nose. So, uh, I, and I, th I think it's made by Boiron, I think that was the, uh, the same company. So, they, they had to pull it from the market. And, they had to, and uh, because it really wasn't homeopathic, it was really a very, just a very dilute substance. But it was an actual substance in there. Uh, another one, Airborne. Airborne was developed by a second grade teacher with no medical or pharmacy, pharmacy background. Immune support, whatever that is. Traumiel. Traumiel was a, a cream that was used. I don't, have you, you yeah. nodded? Yeah? yeah? Well, that's been. Uh, they, they were sued. And they said, well, you know, they were sued over its claims. One of the claims was uh, it acts in an instant, right? And the old theory of homeopathy, things get worse before they get better. Doctor approved, no, no doctor had approved it. Anyway, they lost a lawsuit, and it was pulled from the Canadian market. Now, UK and Australia, Australia especially, Australia, they don't have the lobbying that they do in the US. Australia has completely eliminated uh, homeopathic, uh, you cannot make a homeopathic claim. You can sell homeopathy, but you can't make any claims about it. In the UK, you can get it on the national health. There are the royal family. The royal family are big, big home, you know, believers in homeopathy. But there's a big. They're spending about 11 million pounds a year on homeopathic treatment. What a waste of resources! And someone's, you know, uh, realizing that maybe spending 11 million pounds on water is not a good way to spend a limited set of resources. Right on. They've changed a little bit. This is Oscillococcinum, which is a which is made from duck's liver. This is diluted to 200 C, serially diluted to 200, 200 times. There is no duck liver left in it. It used to say cures flu. But because of <coughs> because of <coughs> private lawsuits, they've changed the packaging. Is there anywhere on that packaging that it says that it does anything? It says, be prepared for flu-like symptoms, which are body aches, headaches, yeah. then the name of it says it's a homeopathic mess. And then there's some very true things, non-drowsy, no side effects, no drug interactions works naturally with your body. And it doesn't say anything. This, this is a... Uh, they, they changed it. They, they pulled the original packaging from the, the market because it didn't make actual claims of curing flu. And it's interesting that the fourth law of homeopathy states that you, there is no diagnosis. Remember that? You're all individuals. There is no such thing as a general cure. And yet, you can go to Walmart here in town and you can get uh, homeopathic cures. In the name, <laughs> as effective as the leading homeopathic treats. And people say, well, okay, so it's a placebo effect. You know, what is, what is wrong with that? You know, placebos are very effective. You know, placebos do work. And that's why in all, um, in all drug tests, you measure the real drug against a placebo, not just against nothing, because they found out that placebos are very, very powerful. And if you, they found out that um, red pills are more, red pills are more effective for depression, green pills are more effective for the digestive problems, two pills are more effective than one, even though there's nothing in it. 
injections are more effective than the pills, even if you're just injecting water. So there is a there is a mind-body connection without doubt. You know, without doubt. But the question is, is it is it ethical to uh, to give a placebo? Well, in the homeopathy case, it's water. You know, and it succeeds as it's placebo. Now, placebo effects are notoriously unreliable. The patient who feels the benefit today may not feel it tomorrow. It's, it's, a, it's very susceptible to the patient's mood. Knowingly giving a placebo to a patient would be unethical in most instances. Either clinicians tell the truth, i.e. this is a placebo, in which case the effect is likely to disappear. Or they do not, in which case they are liars. And that is, that is a very damaging prospect to not be able to trust what your doctor is telling you. Now, giving placebo to a patient with a serious condition that could otherwise be cured by, by, by regular medicine, modern medicine, seriously endangers, endangers the health of that patient. We saw that with Steve Jobs, so we don't put that in. And in order to generate a placebo effect, you don't need a placebo. All treatments, when you go to the doctor and gives you pills, it comes automatically with placebo by virtue of the fact that you take your pills, but by virtue of the fact you're doing something. So, for placebos to work, a patient really has to believe something is untrue. And most homeopaths do not deliberately deceive their patients. They believe this works. And they the arguments made are that, well, it's patient choice. I, you know, I, I want to be autonomous. And there is a big imbalance. When you go to the doctor, he sits down and he says, well, I, I've got some, uh, you know, we ran your test and your, your T cells are well elevated, your, your C3 complement through the roof, and I'm sorry about that anti-PS DNA antibody count, I just never expected it. You sat there thinking, what is he talking about? You cannot really ask questions because there is such an imbalance of knowledge that you feel somewhat patronized, that you cannot participate in your own, in your own healing. Whereas homeopaths, it's a very simple prospect. You know, if something causes the disease in healthy people, it will, it will cure you. No problem. So, so autonomy, and it's, you know, autonomy is not a bad thing. Being involved in your own in your own healing is a very good thing, and it's getting harder and harder to do as, as medical advancements uh, proceed. And it's a very challenge to draw the line between paternalism and autonomy. And, uh, and the, the, the real issue is when, you know, when it causes self-harm, that is really when you need, need to step in. Failing to seek medical care is... Uh, you know, when it's a substitute for medical treatment, is you know, it's probably one of the most dangerous. Um, Twenty dollars for a, a pint of water, um, and not only that. After, as a nurse, you you see many medical notes, and you see the history, and you can see lots of people going to various, uh, trying to get various treatments, alternative treatments before they seek real treatment. And in this case of Steve Jobs, if you wait too long, sometimes it's over. There's also a credibility issue. Now, you all have cell phones, you all travel in planes, and you, hopefully you, you trust science. And you think science is a good thing. And you know your phones work because they have a battery with some lithium and some iron, and there's satellites and towers and there's all that. And you, you don't question it. You don't say, well, I believe, you know, I read on the internet that my phone works through fairy dust. You, know, you, you accept that the science is true. We seem to stop there when it comes to healthcare for some reason. We seem to have a great mistrust of science in healthcare. And while people believe in homeopathy, it adds to that, that credibility gap between what is scientifically valid and what is wishful thinking. So, where does that leave us? And uh, it's just unfortunate. So we cannot simply solve the arguments in a formula that gives us an ethical answer. 
it seems clear that the ethical downsides to homeopathy outweigh its benefits. You can use the example of an ineffective defibrillator to point out that the use of such a device in the context of medical care would be morally unjustifiable. Because it is inherently ineffective, home homeopathy cannot be ethically neutral. It follows that the purchase, deployment, and promotion of homeopathy, homeopathy is morally unacceptable. Now, in this last slide, there is a seeing these motivational posters. It says, homeopathy, it may seem pretty, but it's still just water. Now, that's, it's, it's not very funny. But if I dilute it slowly, and it fades away, look how funny it gets, right? Apparently not. <laughs> so as it fades away, it gets stronger. And uh, I don't know whether I've changed anyone's minds on homeopathy, or educated on what homeopathy actually is. I did a little survey before I did the talk, and people said, Oh yeah, I know about homeopathy. Oh, it's a healing, it's natural stuff, it serves, it's, you know. Oh, you should come along then, and see what it's really all about. Okay, there's, there's homeopathy. Thank you.